Oh, hey friends. What day is it? Oh, this is August 2nd. And I'm recording this not on August 2nd because I'm on vacation. By the time you see this, I'm gonna be in a different state, probably still driving on the road. But you're gonna be in good hands today. Paul Wolf will be bringing our message here in a little while. And we still get to worship together. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'll watch this again when I'm gone, once I get to my destination. Remember, we're the body of Christ. Hope you all continue to remember that each and every day as we go forward in our deepening our understanding of what it means to be the church. Blessings to you, and I'll see you later. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Holy and loving God, we need you. We need you to help us remember we are not alone. We need you to remind us who we are. We need you to help us remember our story and that your unquenchable love is the heart of it. We need you to also help us bring to life the broad sweep of your welcoming love, remembering it is for all, not just for some, and meant to be shared to the very ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. We are God's household, crafted by the architect of creation. Our hearts a shelter for the outcast, our hands open to the stranger. We are God's people, created in the divine image, to tell others of God's love, to offer mercy as freely as we have received it. We are God's children, called to give of ourselves, chosen to serve the lost and lonely, gifted to minister to a hurting world. Every
to be, to work, to speak out, to witness and worship for everyone born the right to be free. Our scripture today is from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Good afternoon, sports fans, and welcome to Shawnee Mission South by Southwest Field, where tonight we are going to be having the game of the year. It's the annual scrimmage between your fighting beavers of Cleaver High and the alumni from years gone by. This year's alumni squad features the Wilson brothers, who dominated the league over a six-year period. Let's not waste any more time. Let's meet the team. All right. So glad to be representing Cleaver High, my alumni school. Cleaver, <laughs> I'm Jeff Wilson, wide receiver. JJ Wilson, wide receiver. Woody Wilson, wide receiver. Jocko Wilson, wide receiver. Stumpy Wilson, tight end. Um, I want a Big Mac and a large fry to go. <laughs> it's Wilson, wide receiver. Wilson Wilson, wide receiver. Wee Willie Wilson, wide receiver. Oh my, those Wilson brothers sure have aged. And I'm afraid that the person in charge of arranging the alumni team forgot that all the Wilson brothers played wide receiver. Why, even Stumpy started off as a wide receiver until he had that unfortunate head-on collision with the goalpost. You know, this reminds me of an important lesson I learned in church. You see, the Bible tells us that God gives us all different gifts and abilities, and he does this for several reasons, but one of them is that as we grow into a church, there are many positions that need to be filled. Just like a football team needs more than just wide receivers. You need a quarterback and a center and lineman. The church needs many positions to be filled as well. Some people are comfortable perhaps standing in front and speaking in front of a large group. Others might prefer to help with music, or still others prefer not to be seen at all. They take care of important jobs that just seem to get done, and the rest of us show up, and it, everything looks great. You know, to have a strong team, to have a strong church, all the positions need to be filled. And just like these, this team out here practices, your life is, in essence, a practice as well. You see, as you're growing up, God's going to give you experiences. 
that are going to allow you to really refine who you are and what strengths you have and what things you're really good at so that as you get older you're going to have opportunities to step in and fill those needs in the church why what would church look like if all of us were in the sound booth trying to run sound with nobody to lead music or to help new people who aren't familiar with our church and usher them in what if there was nobody to get the Sunday school supplies just wouldn't be the same would it maybe you know what areas God wants you to be and positions God wants you to fill in the church already I challenge you this week pray to God to open up paths that are going to lead you to gain the experience you need to be a strong church member let's end in a prayer dear Heavenly Father we thank you for loving us and for giving all of us a chance to fill an important position in the church be with us and help us be acceptance of that role and to do it in your glory. And all God's children said, Amen. Play ball. From Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. About that time, while the number of disciples continued to increase, a complaint arose. Greek-speaking disciples accused Aramaic-speaking disciples because their widows were being overlooked in the daily food service. The twelve called a meeting of all disciples and said, It isn't right for us to set aside proclamation of God's word in order to serve tables. Brothers and sisters, carefully choose seven well-respected men from among you. They must be well respected and endowed by the Spirit with exceptional wisdom. We will put them in charge of this concern. As for us, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the service of proclaiming the word. This proposal pleased the entire community. They selected Stephen, a man endowed by the Holy Spirit with exceptional faith, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. The community presented these seven to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. God's word continued to grow. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased significantly. Even a large group of priests em embraced the faith. Good morning. I'm uh, grateful to be here and looking forward to sharing a message with you. Uh, I've got a couple of, of thank yous uh, to give in, in the, uh, at the opening, just to let you know that there were other people uh, and articles that were written and sources that 
uh, really help to stimulate my imagination and our imaginations together as we come to look at the uh, sixth chapter of Acts, the first few verses, and the story of the situation there. Um, there was an article by David Powell of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois, that, that help, was very helpful. There's another one by John Judas, a pastor of the Messiah Lutheran Church in Highland, California. Uh, that was illuminating and fun. And, and there was William Willimon, who is the dean of the chapel and a professor at Duke Divinity School. He had some things that uh, were, were reminding us of the place of Scripture uh, and, and that Acts is not just a history, but I'll get, I'll get back to that. And finally, uh, a, a professor of New Testament at Messiah College in Grantham, PA, Rita Halteman Finger, had a wonderful way of reimagining the setting and of helping to contextualize what was going on. Uh, and we'll be sharing some of her insights into that and drawing on them. And finally, I want to thank Howard and Melanie for inviting me to share with you today. Now, before we get started, would you join me uh, in, in the spirit of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of the things that uh, William Willimon reminded us is that when scripture is pronounced in sanctuary, when we hear it in worship, um, it's the voice of the resurrected Lord, so that it's a living word, a living witness. And it's not just something we sit back and look at. Um, it has a, a, a very interesting way of being a dynamic presence, a dynamic force uh, in, in our midst. Um, he, he, um, his insights and his remarks on this led me to see that Scripture interrogates us. I mean, when we engage the stories uh, in Acts, we have to look at ourselves and how the Spirit is at work in us and the questions of what does it mean to be the church are very, very, they brought to life. So that these become moments for us to stop and reconsider and, and in some sense take, take a, a look at ourselves and see how are we doing? How are, how are we at being the church? And how was that, that first church Jerusalem doing what they did? And, and the answer to that is it's the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is at the heart of the church, all that we do and all that we are. And the power of the Holy Spirit is, is what but the presence of the living Christ, the resurrected Lord, among us and in us and through us and for us. So let's take a look at First Church Jerusalem and see what was going on. It, 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 we need to remember that Acts is written by the same gospel author that wrote Luke. In fact, it's a continuation of Luke. Uh, and, and even though it's separated by a couple of books in, in our uh, modern Bible, it really could be taken together as Luke and Acts. And so the arc of Luke continues on into Acts, and the story of Jesus then becomes the story of the, the early church and the apostles who then are going to open up um, and, and live into the resurrection life that Jesus brings us. Uh, they're going to spread the word, uh, the gospel. So what happens in, in Jerusalem is pretty extraordinary, to say the least. I mean, Pentecost, I mean, that, that sort of set, set the church on fire, didn't it? And, and suddenly a small group of people started to become a large group of people as the Spirit descended on uh, and, and brought to light the truth that people were looking for. And they came, to, they came to faith. They came to faith leaps and bounds. What we have is uh, an extraordinary church. And, and there's a, a community of radical sharing that grows up. A community of radical sharing. And in, in chapter 4 we see that everybody uh, has enough. Uh, that they've sold their, their property and made it available to each other. And they've, they've taken care to see that nobody is in want. So, so we have a situation of enough. 
uh, and things are going along real great. And then we get to the sixth chapter and there's a bump. There's a bump. Now the sixth chapter follows on the heels of, of one of the um, one of the punchlines to a joke that a kid who grew up in Detroit found very humorous, you know, the jokes that, that we have in the Bible, is what's the first uh, car to be mentioned in the New Testament? Well, it's in Acts, it's when the disciples were all in one accord. Well, interestingly uh, enough, uh, it's not an accord that, that one of my, my partners in dialogue here refers to, but it's... Uh, he says that the, the church is going along. John Judy's says that the church is going along strong. They were all in one accord. And then he says, Now the Rolls Royce of unity, whistling down Harmony Highway, hammers headlong into a wall of discord. There are two sides, and everyone knows which side they're on. The Greeks and their widows are one factor marked by the language and culture, even though most are Jews by birth. Everybody knows which side they're on. There seems to be an issue, a, a them and an us. Doesn't take much to make a them and an us. Um, if you, you spend any time in rural Kansas where they consolidated high schools back in the early 60s, and, and the 70s, and you'll find out that little towns that are four miles apart, even though they attend a common high school, namely Waterville and Blue Rapids and Valley Heights, they used to have their own high schools, and there's a tension between the towns. Now, you can't think of people as being that much different if they're four miles apart in rural Kansas up near the Nebraska border in the Flint Hills, but there is a rivalry there. There is an us and a them, Blue Rapids, Waterville. Well, it's less now, but but it still, it still leaked through from time to time when we were serving there. But let's get back to uh, this story. Uh, what seems to have, have happened? Well, there was a report to the disciples that uh, there was a, uh, an issue. Uh, the Greek-speaking widows were upset, uh, and the word got back to the, to the disciples and that it had to do with the, uh, the meal, the community meal. And here we need to, to look at some, some careful translations uh, to give us a hand. Um, we remember that day by day, this is from the second chapter of Acts, day by day they gathered together in the temple courts. They also broke bread in their homes and shared their food with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And day by day the Lord added to their community those who were being saved. Now, this meal, this meal is, is one that is a common sacred meal. At the end of the day, when the people come in from work, it, it's a time when they gather together. And the word broke bread has a lot of overtones from, from the Last Supper. Christians, when they got together... And they broke bread. It was significant. In fact, it may have been one of the formational elements of the early church. Um, and to be part of that sacred meal took a whale of a lot of work and a, a lot of organization. And trying to climb back into what was happening at the time, um, Rita Finger, that professor of New Testament, uh, is, is pretty helpful uh, she helps us to reimagine what was what was going on, uh, and and we need to be reminded, I think, to some extent. We need to be reminded. Oh, let me find it. That nobody was in want, so if if nobody's in want, they have enough. Then it's not a food line. And it's not a meal on wheels. And, and the translation distribution may be misleading us. Um, and, and here's where, where uh, Professor Finger is very helpful. And she wants us to reimagine in order to get out of our context and reimagine the context closer to what it may have actually been. And so she suggests helpfully, instead of our capitalistic, materialistic, individualistic, Western lifestyle today, what would life be like in a totalitarian, authoritarian, patriarchal, 
agricultural subsistence culture. She goes on to say that kinship, kin group sharing, would be very important. Uh, the importance of belonging. Uh, and, and that a phrase that even exists in some societies today called generalized reciprocity, which I paraphrase as, paraphrase as a survival strategy based on belonging. A survival strategy based on belonging. The point is, it's much cheaper to live in a community of goods in a subsistence society. How vital it was to belong to a group. And she continues, she continues, the culture in which Jesus lived was organized in this way. Can you imagine then what would happen to people who, whom he called to be disciples and leave everything else and follow him? They would not have been able to survive unless the Jesus people organized their own kin group. This is exactly what must have happened. Now let's take this, this kin group of Galilee peasants and follow them up to Jerusalem with Jesus. And this is where she's reimagining it in a way that I think is very helpful to the context of the story that, that we're seeking to, to get to the, to the root of. They did not know that their leader would be arrested, executed, and then resurrected from the dead. And they, would not, that, that would not be, and they did not know that they would be staying there for quite a while longer. When Pentecost arrives and the Spirit descends, and many hundreds of new people come to believe, they have to get organized big time. Believers who live in Jerusalem must invite out-of-towners into their homes, perhaps add another room upstairs or, or, or into the courtyard. Those from other places must share the money they've brought for supplies and food for everyone. Tools must be shared, child care divided up, and so on, into a thousand details. Now it starts to get... It starts to get interesting, starts to come to life for us. Uh, the sort of thing Luke talks about in Acts 2 and 4 makes perfect sense if you understand how ancient Mediterranean community life is structured. It also means that the communal meals must have been prepared and served by the women. And she, one of her points is that the unseen role of women uh, in the New Testament and in scriptures. Uh, the bread-breaking ritual, which we now call communion, would have been part of the meal, so the work of women was an integral part of the spiritual life of the community. At the end of a day of labor, the daily meal became the central and unifying ritual of the Jesus community. The work of women was literally holding the church together. So what was the issue? What was the issue with the the Greek-speaking women called Hellenists versus the Hebrew-speaking women who were called the Hebrews. It may have been that the folks who'd been with Jesus and had come from Galilee, it may have been that the folks who were with Jesus and came from Galilee and had an Aramaic, Aramaic accent, you know, were the insiders, uh, the originals, um, may have been taking care of the important parts of the meal, may have been doing uh, the big share, and that the Greek-speaking folks, the folks that came from outside, even though they were Jews, they came from outside and um, spoke pr predominantly Greek, and so they would have spoken Aramaic if they spoke it at all. They would have spoken it with an accent. They had different ways. They had different experiences. They had a different subculture that they were bringing into the mix, uh, they might have been relegated to tasks that were not as important to this sacred meal that was common to the community as the folks who already belonged and, and were the, quote, originals. And so doing things um, in the way that they were used to, have we heard this, we've never done We've never done it any other way. Have, uh, doing things in a different way or letting other people into the kitchen may have been a problem and may have been the source of the problem. It may be that even, we know that people had enough, according to chapter 4, they had enough, uh, and, and that everybody's the homes were being opened to strangers, 
and the meal was being prepared for these large in, enlarging groups of of believers if that sacred meal was only handled by a small group of insiders then the women who were coming in from the outside and wanted to help were being asked to do less than one who truly belonged would be asked to do. Don't keep anybody out may have been a matter of letting newcomers in. I mean, really in, so that they could share in the preparation of that sacred holy meal, so that they could stand side to side with the Hebrew-speaking women uh, and, and be a part of the leadership in the, in the community of women that was holding it together. Now, when they gathered, uh, the scriptures tell us in, in Acts chapter 6 that the, the disciples asked everybody, uh, ask their, their, uh, the whole company of disciples, the, the large group, to help solve this issue. And uh, they selected a, a group of leaders among themselves and presented them to the apostles. And the group of leaders were recognized leaders by the Hebrew-speaking community, or excuse me, excuse me, by the Greek-speaking community. And the Greek-speaking community elected a, a group of leaders, seven of them, and every single one of them have a Greek name. Well, that makes sense. These were already leaders, and now they've been authorized, they've been recognized by the apostles uh, as being leaders also. So sharing power was really important, and sharing power with people who were different is going to prove to be crucial in, the, in telling the story of the spread of the church in Acts. But let's get back to the kitchen. If these seven leaders, including Philip, and, and Stephen got together with the ladies. They said, you know, it's okay if you let them help. I mean, really help. Uh, in the heart of the preparation, not just in the, the edges of the preparation. Um, let them light candles and participate in the prayers. Uh, let them draw alongside you. So don't leave anybody out, maybe really letting people in. I mean, it's not just, not, just a polite, not just a polite, nice to meet you, welcome to our church at the door, but a come on in and give us a hand in the kitchen. Roll up your sleeves and join in. In fact, if you've got gifts to share, we want to empower you to do just that. You and us just got melted down by the Holy Spirit into a holy family. Ah, uh, Jesus, we are here. And that may be the message that we want to carry forward from our consideration of Acts chapter 6 today. Loving Creator and Blessed Redeemer, always in the crowds among us are the unhearing ears, the songless tongues, the aimless feet, the empty hands, the joyless eyes, and the lost souls. Yet you did not intend it should remain so. By the example and word of Christ, maintain the rage of our compassion until all have ready access to the justice and love which the gospel proclaims. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you join me for a benediction? Spirit of our living God, Spirit of our risen Christ, Spirit of our changing church, rekindle the fire of our faith, breathe resurrection strength into the witness of our lives, increase forgiveness forged love in our hearts and restore us to your path of peace, bathed in the healing light of justice, mercy, and truth. Now may the love of God and the peace of Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain in you always. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Mm -hmm.